Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about policing and academic thoughts about policing and how we view police. I just want to reiterate right at the beginning, this is not a forum for people who have a grudge against the police. So unfortunately, if that's what you're here for, uh, this is not the place that you need to be because this is not what we're going to talk about. We're going to have an intellectual conversation about police and what they do, what their purpose is, and how different people you know what the academic views are of policing in society so that's what we're going to talk about tonight and of course if anybody else has questions about road tests uh, uh, anything to do with CDL driver tra driver training those types of things all by all means I'll help you with all all of that uh, JF SA 380 has a question about weight all right uh, in the states for overhaul Gross vehicle weight, you're allowed 80,000 pounds. It's uh, 12,000, 34,000, 34,000 on a tandem, tandem truck. So on the steer axles, you're allowed 12,000 pounds. On the steer axles, you're allowed 34,000 pounds on the rear tandems and 34,000 pounds on the trailer. In Canada, it is 5,500 kilograms on the steers. It's 17,500 kilograms on a tandem axle and it's 23,500 kilograms on a triple. If you're running anywhere else in BC, I believe it's 22,000. It's 1,000 kilograms less JFSA, so just take note of that. Okay, and I do need to get a video about that as well. So <laughs> Tommy's here, Corey's here, Brick for Wheel, Bricks for Wheels, he's moderating. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, Corey is really good at getting videos up and those types of things for you. So, uh, yes, the stream, stream has started. Yes, there we go. And uh, JFSA, what uh, kinds of vehicles are you running? Are you running mostly tandem, tandem? Are you running tritum? If you're running back and forth to the states, uh, you're not running into Michigan, are you? You're just going to be running, uh, are you on the west coast here? Fresner, yes, there are some bad cops that unfortunately... Uh, give a bad image to some of the police forces, but we're going to talk about that a little bit more. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, Generation 4. It depends whether the uh, AI, you know, um, e IA, rather, internal investigation gets involved or whatnot, or whether we have legislators and politicians who get involved as well. And we can, we can ob obviously talk about all that. Anita, welcome to Smart Drive Test. Welcome to the live stream. Antigua. That's uh, quite a ways away. And what time is it at Antigua, Anita? So if you're new to Smart Drive Test, Smart Drive Test helps new drivers get a license, veteran drivers to remain crash free, and CDL drivers to start a career as a truck or bus driver. So if you're watching on the replay or you're new to Smart Drive Test, be sure to hit that subscribe button as well. Hit that bell, that way you'll get instant notification when I get the videos up for you, and as well, give the video a thumbs up if you like what you see here and again if you have any questions about road tests or trucking or anything like that I'd be more than happy to help you with that but tonight we're going to talk about policing and have I'm going to try something a little bit different and see how this goes I'm going to have a bit of a, an intellectual discussion an academic discussion about policing and different views of policing Matt how are you tonight uh, wild man uh, which carrier, Wildman, are you taking a uh, road test for? Which major U.S. carrier? Can I ask that? 10.03 p.m. Okay, so you're on the Eastern Standard Time, Anita, so it's not too late for you then. Um, 6.10. No, four hours. You're in a different time zone. You're one over from that. <laughs> Jubilees22, you are most welcome. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm just waiting for... Uh, yeah, um... Commercial over the road. Okay, so yeah, just uh, take your time. Uh, keep it between the lines uh, there, wild man. In terms of your road test, do a good pre-trip inspection, and that's basically what you're going to be doing. Uh, drive smart, BC. <laughs> I'm glad you're here. Thanks for that. So, Yes, Kyle, you are very right. Police and highway patrol are two different animals. Yes, and that is one. Of, that is a good point, Kyle, that you made about police. Is that there are different branches of uh, policing and different police organizations. So, say for regular constables uh, who are in the police force, as opposed to specialized uh, divisions of the police. If you have a SWAT team or you have uh, 
policing that just does traffic. These are different organizations and they tend to take on different cultures. So we can talk a little bit about that after I get done the presentation, but I'll just carry on with the presentation here. Okay, so Wildman, you're in central Illinois. So basically what they're looking for, Wildman, in terms of a pre-trip inspection for a job application is they're looking for making sure that you're going to be safe. So in other words, uh, is your pre-trip inspection good? Are you paying attention to the vehicle? Are you able to do the paperwork? And can you drive the vehicle safely without running into anything and basically, you know, navigating those types of things? So mostly what they're going to be doing on a road test tomorrow is, is they're just going to do your pre-trip inspection and then take you for a drive. Yes, Generation 4, you are correct about that. And, we, and like I said, we can talk about all that. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to head over to the PowerPoint presentation and get going on the presentation and talk to you about policing and then we can have a discussion afterwards and I can answer any questions and by all means this is not a definitive look at policing it's a very high level overview of policing uh, you know academics have written lots and lots of books about police and policing and how it gets done and those types of things so Okay, Anita, so did you pass your road test, Anita? Uh, uh, not nervous. <laughs> Thanks so much, Anita. Okay, so further ado, here we go. Okay, presentation, there we go. So, who are the police? We have a different perception of policing, and just as a sort of general overview, most uh, police forces, we have different kinds of police forces in the world, and defi definitely the uh, police have a culture, and how society reacts to police is very different. In Canada, we, are, we have a deference to police, we respect them, we don't mouth off to them and those types of things. Uh, in the United States, I would say that it tends to be a little bit more uh, divided between police and the public. It tends to be a much more... Um, hostile society and police tend to be much more vigilant about their own safety and tend to be sort of uh, a, you know wearing bulletproof vests and we tend to watch a lot of television that reflects how police are perceived in the United States of America. In Australia, when I lived in Australia, policing is on a very different footing. Society has a it has a very derogatory attitude and disrespect for their police force in Australia. And then on the other hand, we have police forces in uh, the UK where they do not carry firearms for the most part. If they have something like 9-11 that happened almost 20 years ago now, uh, they do carry uh, they do carry weapons and or they don't carry re weapons rather. And for the English population to see police who are carrying weapons and firearms and those types of things it's uh, they're very much how shall I say it's it's kind of it's not the norm for them and they're really taken out I just I'm just trying to get the video up here so sorry my apologies just bear with me for one sec here There we go. Okay. This is not cooperating. Bear with me. There we go. Okay. So, who am I? My name is, uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, for those of you who haven't watched the animated videos or know who I am, Rick August, PhD. I was a truck driver for most of the 1990s and into the 2000s. I became a driving instructor in 1997. Uh, and returned back to university and finished my degree in 2000 and then went on to do a doctorate at the University of Melbourne in Australia where I did a degree in history, uh, legal history specifically, which is the study of police courts and prisons and my expertise is in policing as it relates to uh, traffic and the social and the traffic revolution that happened at the beginning of the 20th century where road speeds went from 6 miles an hour to 30 miles an hour in a 40 year period. And that's essentially the same as saying today that by the year 2060, we'll all be driving around cities at 250 kilometers an hour. And road speeds are going to increase by 500%, which is, you know, for most of us, a bit, you know, laughable. We can't even conceive that. But that's essentially what happened at the beginning of the 20th century. And there was a huge impact on policing and law. And policing changed 
dramatically in response to that traffic revolution. And I'll talk a little bit about that in the presentation and how policing began to modernize at the beginning of the 20th century. So, and then while I was going to university, uh, prior to doing my doctorate degree, I drove buses for Greyhound for a year, and then I became a regional bus driver part-time while I was going to university uh, for V-Line in Australia. So that's basically who I am, and so I do have some authority in talking about police and uh, perceptions of police within society. So this week I got two videos up. I got the navigation and route planning video up, and I do apologize for that delay in getting that done. It was overdue, uh, but there is some good information. I've had some good feedback about it as well. Uh, yesterday I put up the left-hand turn and pressured, and actually I got a lot of good comments about that and talking about social driving. And actually next week in the live feed, I think I'll talk about uh, social driving and the pressures that new drivers and some drivers feel when they're driving. So if you haven't had a look at those two videos that are new this week, do have a look at those. All right, so police or origins. Policing is not, uh, it hasn't been around forever. Uh, the first organized police forces started in 1829 uh, with legislation in the UK and most of the police forces that we had after that that all came, uh, that all came to fruition were based on this paramilitary organization that was founded under what was called uh, Sir Robert Peel. And Sir Robert Peel is really seen as the father of modern policing. And it came about with the London Metropolitan Police Services. Now there's a few distinguishing characteristics of the police force that came about in, in the early part of the 19th century. First of all, the officers wore, or the police constables, they weren't officers, they were police constables, wore blue uniforms. And the reason that they wore blue, blue uniforms was to distinguish them, to make very distinct separation between the police force and the military because militaries were used very much by the elite within the UK and other places about uh, to you know quell riots and any sort of civil uprising and those types of things so they were in blue woolen tunics they were not armed they only wore uh, carried truncheons as a weapon and most of them walked predetermined uh, cop beats as well, policing at that time was very much about class control. It was not about uh, policing all of society. These Most of these police officers were on uh, a predetermined route and they were there simply to check doors and control uh, the general population, which tended to be the lower class of society. And that carried on for most of the 19th century until the beginning of the 20th century when the motor car began to make an appearance. And this is the Tin Lizzy, the Model T, which revolutionized traffic in North America, uh, and all of you know about Henry Ford and his rise to power with the, um, the building and mass production of motor cars that were accessible to the general population. But the other thing in many parts of the world, and very much in the first, you know, 1900 to sort of 1920 before motor cars became available for everyone and affordable and a secondhand market was created. This was the first time that wealthy elites within society came in contact with police and it very much changed the face of policing. As well uh, because of the what people perceived as the, the decline of public order because traffic crashes were increasing because of increased road speeds and most people saw them as driving furiously or road hogs on our roadways and those types of things. The very class of people that owned motor cars, because you have to understand that, well, in Australia, for example, motor cars, most motor cars in 1900 to 1920 cost somewhere in the area of sort of 750 to 1500 pounds. When most police constables were only making five pounds a week, or sorry, police constables and other working class people were only making five pounds a week. So motor cars were very much out of the price range of most people. So the, the elite and the wealthy who were in legislation and in positions of power, they were the position people that were called upon to draft legislation and put in controls to regulate themselves, which there was a great deal of reluctance to do that. And most motor car legislation didn't come about until 1910, 1915. And then you started to get legislation in place and the legislation increased police powers. 
The other thing that was happening at the beginning of the 20th century, obviously, was the First World War. Uh, all of this advent of technology that came about at the end of the 19th century, so police began to change in response to this technology of photo photography, fingerprints, bicycles, horses, uh, motor vehicles. I mean, obviously, they had horses before, but it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century that in large rural populations that police constables were put on horses. Until then, most of them were urban police and most of them uh, walked a predetermined route. And by this time, the predetermined route of police constables as well began to fall out of favor because a lot of criminals <laughs> were able to learn where the police were walking and knew exactly when the police were going to be at predetermined destinations on the route. So the beat cop started to fall out of favor in uh, in favor of or moving towards uh, just that they patrolled an area and could show up in any place at any time. The other thing that began to increase and change policing at the beginning of the 20th century was the popularization of police stories and this is where the idea of he always gets his man and this was comes out of the RCMP the Royal Canadian Mounted Police here in Canada the Royal Canadian Mounted Police one could argue and it has been argued effectively that the Royal Canadian Mounted Police are the most recognized police force in the world and this is due to the popularization popularization of Zany Gray's King of the Royal Mounted and many people followed this TV or this comic book series, and it was very much this in combination with other things that were happening at the beginning of the 20th, 20th century that began it to increase police presence within our society. The first thing was obviously their uniforms, they had weapons. Uh, there were some police forces in the world, the Royal Irish Constabul uh, Constabulatory, uh, the Victoria Police, uh, the Rural Victoria Police the RCMP and police forces in the United States all carried weapons and this made them a, a formidable force within our society. As well, police forces were sanctioned to use authority, uh, or sorry, police forces had sanctioned authority by acts of legislation to use force. So it wasn't something that they did on a regular basis, but it was something inherent in the the group of people who were police officers that they had legislated authority to use force as well police forces are a paramilitary group there's a there's a hierarchy within the police force <clears throat> people start out especially at the beginning of the 20th century they were police constables and then they were sergeants and then they became officers and superintendents today there tends to be more ranks within the force and as some of you were saying at the beginning in the comments and those types of things that different, you know, uh, state patrol is very different from sheriffs and sheriffs are very different from uh, city police forces and those types of things. And we have some of that in Canada here as well. Uh, sheriffs, for example, here in Canada tend to be uh, what bailiffs are in the United States who work in only in courthouses. And then we have specialized traffic police as well. Uh, so police shows, and this ties in with the comic book and the police shows that we see on television today and those types of things, uh, lethal weapon and all of those types of things and the things that police are able to do, all of this increases their presence within society and we see them uh, as more ubiquitous than they actually are. More ubiquitous means that, they're, that we think they're in more places than police actually are within our society. So... There are two schools of thought in terms of academics when it comes to police. Uh, the first school of thought is, is that the community gets the police force it deserves, and this police force that the community gets is the police force that stamps out crime. And one of the things that I'm going to talk about a little bit later is, is that police, very little of what police do is about stamping out and, and catching criminals. <laughs> A small percentage of the police force is actually allocated to that task. However, it, it benefits police forces in their public image to have society believe that they are the thin blue line between the community and the criminal organizations in our society. The other school of thought in terms of police forces is that police forces are the tool of the elite 
to enforce or impose their will on the rest of society. We can see that here with this uh, image to protect and serve the ruling class. That's the other perception of police forces. And I don't think that it is that. There are times during the, uh, the, the, the G20 summits and those types of things that yes, in fact it does. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't think that's, I don't think that either school of thinking is totally true. I think that there's a little bit of both depending on what police force you're looking at in the world. And as I said, I'm talking very generally here. The other thing about police forces is that uh, police cultures tend to be conservative by the very nature. And I guess Jack Reacher kind of summed it up. Who's a fictional character who said that there are three things cops never do. They never vote Democrat never drive Cadillacs and they never drive their own vehicle, which was said in the movie, <laughs> if you've ever seen the Jack Reacher movie. So deterrence policing, the way that deterrence policing works is uh, it works through enforcement, education, and engineering. And it, enforcement, education, and engineering can be applied to just about any aspect of society, but it's very prevalent in traffic and education and enforcement uh, tend to be one and the, th the same thing. If somebody is prosecuted and they're convicted of a crime or uh, some other violation under the legislation, the act where they can be convicted, then what happens is the police prosecute, the person is convicted, and then what happens is, is that they publicize the conviction to show you that you will get caught. And what happens is the, the, the population begins to internalize their own policing and the police force doesn't have to have as big of a presence. For example, if you get caught speeding and you get a speeding ticket and you get convicted of that speeding ticket, then you're not going to speed for probably a year or not because you're still looking around for the police and thinking that you're going to get caught for speeding. It's the same thing with drink driving. They do a similar thing. Someone is uh, prosecuted, they're pulled over, they're prosecuted, they're taken to court of law and they're convicted for drink driving and then they publicize that and people believe that they can't drink drive. Obviously this works in concert with a lot of other things like public awareness programs and those types of things. So this is what's called deterrence policing where somebody is prosecuted and convicted and then it is publicized to indicate that you will in fact get caught. Now what I said before was is that a small percentage of what police actually do is catch criminals. Most of, and that's not, that's a, you gotta be, I gotta kind of say that with some degree of in, um, caution because there are lots of acti activities within our society that have been criminalized, but people don't view them as criminal activity. For example, drink driving in Canada is charged under the criminal code of Canada. So if you are caught and convicted for drink driving in Canada, you are seen as a criminal and you are a criminal because uh, just try and go across the border after you've had a drink driving charge. But lots of people don't view it as a criminal offense. So most of what police do, most of police resources are allocate, allocated towards public order and public safety. And it's order maintenance work. It's And, and traffic is a great deal of what order maintenance is about, is, is that they're making sure that people aren't speeding, that they're ma not making a left, uh, illegal left-hand turns and those types of things because if people drive against traffic laws in, in contravention of traffic laws rather, then it's gonna contribute to chaos and crashes and congestion and all of those things that we see that are banes of traffic and it endangers public safety. So order maintenance is seen to uphold public safety and those two things tie into one another and go in tandem with one another. So lots of what police do is policing traffic, but this is not, uh, this is not the public perception that police want society to see. And something else that police do is, is that they police drink driving. And I talked a little bit about this and I'll just kind of give you an overview that there has been problems with drinking and driving ever since the advent of the horse and then advent of the motor car. People have been drinking and driving. And the interesting thing about this is that by the late 1960s, drinking was such a culture that people were dying at a, an incredible rate uh, by the late 1960s. Road crashes per 100,000 kilometers by the end of the 19th, or road deaths rather, per uh, 1 million kilometers, I believe it is, it was like 8 or 9. And I mean, today it's about 2.1 or something. So it's reduced drastically. So what happened by the end of the late 1960s was is that politicians implemented legislation against drink driving and it became 
very much policed to try and control traffic deaths related to drinking and driving. And as well, there are community, um, there were uh, public outreach or public campaigns to try and reduce drink driving as well. And probably the most famous one was uh, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Driving, which was started by Candy Leitner in the United States and California. And Candy Leitner's daughter was killed by a drunk driver and she founded MAD and then she became on to really uh, spearhead the organization and really bring public campaigns to reduce the amount of drinking and driving within society. The other problem with drinking and driving, and I've got drinking, driving, dating, and distracted, and this, I need to come up with a better D for the distracted. This is for young people. One of the academic propositions that's been put forward is to either reduce the drinking age or increase the drinking age so it doesn't coincide with these other three things that young people are now dealing with at one and the same time. Although this is somewhat taking care of itself because young people aren't so keen to get their license as they once were. Many of them are living in large urban areas and have access to public transportation. But for some young people, drinking, driving, dating, and distracted driving, working with their cell phones and those types of things all came in, come in at the same time. So for young people who have very little experience driving and very little experience drinking and very little experience dating and working with phones and those types of things, those, three, three th uh, those four things come together and make it uh, difficult for uh, drinking and driving and for police to reduce the number of traffic deaths associated with young drivers and the other things that come into play here. Now one of the interesting things about drink driving is that it's become incredibly bureaucratic and even though police are still responsible for prosecuting and convicting drunk drivers, what's happened is, is that the legal profession has gotten involved, lawyers have gotten involved, and it takes an incredible long time for a police officer to prosecute a drunk driver. And if it's not a police officer who specializes in convict or prosecuting drunk drivers, the chances of a conviction in a court of law are low. So what has happened in the province of British Columbia, which is interesting, is that the province under the Highway Traffic Act has passed laws that allow police to ha impose a 24-hour uh, suspension and there are some other penalties that I'm not fully aware of, but we could talk about that in the discussion afterwards. And there was some rumblings for some time that it was, it, it's what the legal term is called ultra-virus, which means that it's beyond the power of the state to be able, or beyond the power of the province to be able to do that because drunk driving is charged under the federal legislation. But what I learned in the last year or so was is that the reason that they have done this and nobody has uh, challenged this in a higher court is because police, it became almost to the point where police could not secure, secure conviction for drink driving. So this is another tool that legislators have given police to combat the problem of drink driving within our society. So as I said, that is a very high level uh, overview of policing, sort of different schools of thought on policing, and we can have conversations about this. And as I said, I've, I've really just scratched the surface of what policing is and different police cultures within the world, different countries in the world and how police, uh, how the society views policing. And that there's two different kinds of views of policing. One is, is that the community gets the police force that it deserves. The other one is, is that, uh, police are a tool of the ruling class of society. And as I said, we can talk about all that, but mo a lot of the work that police do is related to order maintenance and public safety and public order within our society. And a lot of that allocation of resources for policing goes towards traffic and upholding traffic laws and those types of things. And as I said, we can have a discussion about this and I'll just uh, get things back over here. Just one sec, bear with me. And I'll put the comments back here for Corey. He'll be after me. There we go. Okay. And I'll get back over here to the comments. <laughs> All right. Ford Model T. Yes, the Model T, for those of you who don't know, the Model T... Uh, was in production between 1908 and 1927. It went out of production in 1927. When it went into production in 1908, it sold for 
Uh, I'm just trying to think now. $295, I believe. And then when it went out of production in uh, 1927, I think it sold for like $98 or something because of mass production and the centralization of raw materials, which Henry Ford was able to do. Oh, uh, Drive Smart BC IRP. What is what is IRP? Because you, no, I I I was talking to police officers and they and they said that. Crown Council prosecutes in BC. Police provide the case for their decision as whether or not to prosecute. Yes, that is true. Okay, IRP. I I am not familiar with that term. Okay, so what I was saying, what I didn't say that that police, most of their resources go to, so most police are involved in traffic policing and order maintenance work on some level. Am I correct about that? Generation four. Uh, that is very much about the history, oh, okay, immediate roadside prohibition. Is that a special immediate roadside prohibition? Is that a special division of the police force that looks uh, that polices uh, drink driving in British Columbia? Okay, Generation Four. To answer your question about that, it's to do with the history and the evolution of the police forces. When police, uh, when the police was founded in the United Kingdom, it was very much about disassoci disassociating them from. Uh, the military and they didn't carry weapons they only carried a truncheon which is just a short billy club so that's how the evolution happened in the UK the RCMP in Canada was founded on uh, the Irish the Royal Irish Constabulatory which was very much a constabulatory that did carry weapons and some people have said throughout history that uh, that you know the Irish Royal Constabulary was armed to the teeth and the RCMP were seen very much in the same light that they were they did carry weapons and that evolved as well you have to think of Canada Canada had uh, its evolution of its police force over the last 150 years or so has also been influenced by the United States of America to some degree not a great deal but to some degree and for those of you from the United States you know that police forces in the states are somewhat different uh, they, there tends to be city police forces, there tends to be regional police forces, there are state police forces and state patrols, uh, there's federal organizations under the FBI, and then there's sheriffs within smaller towns, and all of these sheriffs are all elected officials. Some of these people who are elected as sheriffs in the United States of America do not have police training. They simply get elected by the constituent to be the sheriff within that community. So this is some of the different ways that policing works in and around the world. Okay, so driver pro prohibited and vehicle impounded. So uh, drive smart uh, driver prohibitions. How do the, the driver prohibitions work? Is it a 24-hour prohibition? Are they allowed to put in different uh, amounts of time and those types of things, or does it have to go through to a court law? Okay, so that's good. So. Um, the immediate roadside prohibition is used by all officers who find alcohol impaired drivers supposed to be where collisions are not involved. So then what happens if there's a collision involved? Do they have to send them for a, a, a blood alcohol test or for a blood test rather? All right. Augustine, you passed your road test first time. That's awesome. So that was, uh, Augustine, that was for your uh, car license that you passed your road test. That's really great. Thanks for telling us that. Okay, um, 
Kyle, uh, as a truck driver, do you have any horror encounters? What do you mean by horror encounters? Did I have any uh, criminal activity or those types of things? Okay. Uh, road, uh, wild man, road capacity in the States is not cut up, kept up with the amount of traffic. Do you have any tips when you get pulled over in a freeway? Christian, uh, if you get pulled over on the freeway, what I suggest to you is to go down to the next exit ramp and get off on the exit ramp and try and find some place to pull over. Try not to pull over on the side of the freeway and those types of things. It's just too dangerous. Freeways are not friendly places. Excuse me, I've been there a few times and it just, it's not a place you want to be sitting. Okay. Okay, thanks so much, Tim. Okay, Anita, you're still practicing with your instructor. That's great. Okay, Matt, FBI, CIA, U.S. Marshals, Secret Service, and Border Patrol are all examples of police forces. Yes, so there are a lot of different police forces in the United States for sure and different uh, jurisdictions and specialties. Uh, drug and alcohol and enforcement in the United States is another one in the United States that has a very specific purpose. So lots of different uh, police forces. <laughs> Gordon, how nervous was I? Uh, <laughs> I think I was just, you know, I was in my 20s when I started driving truck and uh, for me, it wasn't as big a deal because I came from a farm experience. So I had a farm background. So I had been driving swathers and combines and those types of things. So when I came to driving a truck, uh, I probably thought I had more ability than I actually did. There's a fair bit of trepidation. And if you, I think if you have trepidation and you have a little bit of fear when it comes to driving truck, I think that's a really good thing because that's going to keep you keen and that's going to keep you aware and doing what you need to be doing when you're driving truck. Generation four, yes. And that's that's a good point, Generation Four, is is that people always speed. They don't drive very few people drive the speed limit, but there is a tolerance with speed limits. You can't always uh drive the posted you know, there like I said, there is a tolerance. So if you drive ten kilometers an hour above the speed limit, for those of you in the States, you drive five to eight miles an hour above the speed limit, please know that the flow of traffic is going to be slightly higher than what uh, what the posted speed limit is, and there is an allowance for that, okay? There we go. Okay, uh, Joshua, no, Interpol was not mentioned. Uh, maybe you can shed some light on that, Joshua, in terms of Interpol, because I don't know a great deal about Interpol. I do know that they are a European organization, Uh, country, uh, David, which one are you talking about in terms of like, which country are you talking about? Because that's, that's difficult to answer. Uh, what happens, uh, David in rural populations is that there tends to be fewer police per number of population simply because the population is spread over a much larger area. So you tend to have, uh, fewer police officers policing that area as opposed to, uh, a, an urban population, you're going to have more police per population density. And that's just simply the way that things work out. Hello there. How are you? <laughs> uh, Anita, what kinds of tips do you want to talk about? Um, you want some driving tips? Uh, what I suggest, Anita, if you're past, practicing for your road test, have a look at the playlist here, uh, Final Road Days Prep. Umar, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, JFSA, what kind of information are you looking for in terms of multiple trailers? What kind of information are you looking for there? Uh, generation 4, they can... However, they're going to upset the driving public because the driving public knows that they can. there's a tolerance in terms of the speed limit. But if you get police officers who are issuing tickets for not driving the posted speed limit, that police officer is not going to be well-liked. Okay, yes, Anita, final day's road test. 
Uh, let's see. Quick overview of skills for road test. Shoulder checking, lots of shoulder checking. You need minimum two shoulder checks for every time you move the vehicle laterally, anytime you make a turn, anytime that you're changing lanes, okay? When you stop in traffic, you have to be able to see the tires of the vehicle in front of you making clear contact with the pavement. Uh, don't block intersections on your road test. Uh, posted speed, speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Make sure that you have a scanning pattern in place. And remember the four basic or the four fundamental components of a road test are speed management, space management, observation, and communication. So observation, make sure that you have a good scanning pattern in place that you are doing uh, uh, <laughs> shoulder checks, got your scanning pattern in place anytime you're executing slow speed maneuvers that you are doing 360 degree scans before you execute the maneuver and make sure that you're looking out the back window before you start to back up. Okay. Uh, observation communication, make sure that you're communicating with other drivers via your signals, your lights, hand gestures, appropriate hand gestures, eye contact and the position of your vehicle on the roadway, speed management, flow of traffic or the posted speed limit, and space management. Make sure you don't get near other road users and keep it between the lines. That's what you need to do for the purposes of a road test. Okay, Gordon. <laughs> yes, Gordon, unfortunately that happens a fair bit and I have had smart drivers come on the channel and tell me that when they parallel park, they bump the car behind them. <laughs> Please don't do that. Uh, okay, off tracking. So JFSA 380. Uh, off tracking is going to be the most pronounced in a tandem tandem unit. If you have multiple trailers, uh, the off tracking is actually less on a set of Super Bs than it is on a 53 foot trailer and they're easier to get around corners because you have two articulation points. Now, the big ones that you're talking about, the trains that are going down the road with two 53 foot trailers behind them, those are essentially uh, only on the freeway. So here in British Columbia, for example, they only run between Kamloops and Vancouver. As soon as they get off the road, off the freeway rather, there's a staging area there and they disconnect them and they pull one trailer into wherever they're going at a time. They don't run them into the cities and those types of things because they're not too, uh, they're not, uh, they're not designed to do that. The, the roads just simply won't handle that kind of thing. They can drive them straight up and down the freeways, but that's it. Okay. So that's well, pretty much what you need to know for hauling uh, more than one trailer. Okay. Generation four, how to report a police officer for bad conduct. Well, you have to get their badge number and you have to go through the process and it's going to be a fairly lengthy process process and you're going to need some sort of evidence in order to report them. Generation four, uh, do police profit off giving tickets? Not to my knowledge, do they do? Okay. Okay. Sebastian, uh, for everyone's been, I heard. <laughs> Okay, Sebastian, uh, rice cakes and carrots, those will work for you to keep you awake. Okay, uh, Joshua, United States Diplomatic Security Service is another police force, but they like U.S. Marshals and FBI only to take on special cases. Yes, okay, 1 to 5 p.m. Yep, so definitely uh, rice cakes and carrots, and as you said, sunflowers are probably the other thing they'll help you out. Yes, Secret Service protects the president. That's correct in the United States. Muhammad. Okay, so Muhammad, as I was just saying, and go back and review this as well, uh, Muhammad, have a look at the playlist uh, road test preparation and the final day's road test. That'll give you the details of what you need to do to for a, a road test. And the, as I was saying, the four fundamental components of a road test observation, communication, space management, and speed management. Those are the four fundamentals of any road test anywhere in the world and doesn't matter what class of vehicle that you're driving, okay? So you have to observe, you have to scanning pattern, you have to shoulder check, and you have to do 360 degree scans before you back up or execute any other slow speed maneuver. You have to communicate with other vehicles, signals, lights, hand gestures, eye contact, uh, and position of your vehicle on the roadway. Speed limit, either the flow of traffic or the posted speed limit, whichever is less, 
And then finally, space management. Don't get near other vehicles and stay, keep it between the lines, okay? Um, <laughs> Gordon, yeah. He probably didn't want to see you watching him try and parallel park. Uh, Muhammad, you are most welcome, my friend. Okay. Okay, so JFSA 380, that's great. Uh, responding to Jen, uh, responding to that question about do police forces make money? Uh, almost all the revenue is, goes to the courts. Uh, none goes to the government, even less back to the police department. Okay, so that's what happens with the revenue. Most of it goes to the courts. Um, a $900 ticket. What were you doing that you got a $900 speeding ticket? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, let's keep it clean, guys. Okay, we can have a discussion about this, but let's not get, let's not, we don't attack one another. All right. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, if other people don't have a question for you, um, just an example, $900 speeding ticket. <laughs> yeah, that's a lot. Um, generation four, there is a process within our system that you can go to court and you can have, you can plead a case. So know that the process is in place, know that the courts of law are there know that there's other ways that you can pay the ticket if you get a big ticket and you can't afford to pay it, okay? What I suggest is that you not speed so that you're not gonna get a ticket is what I suggest. <laughs> oh, that's great, Anita, thanks so much. Christian, thank you. Generation four, you can get a traffic ticket reduced, but you're probably gonna need a lawyer in a court of law. Uh, Sebastian, could you be stopped by police if you weren't aware of a left turn lane and turned into it too late? You can, but it's not likely. If the police a lot of the time can tell whether you made a mistake or not. They're not, you know, they're they're most of them are not vigilant and they're not going to just attack you, okay? So they're people too and they do have a fair bit of discretion uh, in terms of how they police things and whatnot. No, that's okay, Matt. It's the, the, I I appreciate your apology. Thank you. Okay, um, yes, okay, and that's a good point that JFSA 380 just brought up is, is that you can video police, and as I said, they don't like it when you're, you know, when you're being cited, and if you're standing around and you're videoing police, know that you cannot inter, inter, um, interfere with their duties and you know most of the time what police are doing is they're doing what they need to be doing in terms of their job and you know us as bystanders and observers we don't know all of the situation and the circumstances that are going on there is sometimes intelligence that the police have that we don't have for example we don't know who the person is they're pulling over or the person that they're arresting or there's four of them there those types of things yes it's like anything else in society there are media stories about you know police abuse of power and that happens but unfortunately you know it only happens every now and again and it's it's rare most of the time police like everybody else in society are doing the best they can with the information that they have and the skills and the tools that they have so yes you can video them doing their job and those types of things and you can report them and whatnot but know that they're doing the best job that they can in terms of the work that they're doing in our society Okay. Okay, Muhammad, in terms of learning how to drive a car, the best advice I can give you is go in and find, and Corey will pull it up here for you, the slow speed maneuver playlist and go through that in terms of the parking and whatnot. That is the fastest way to learn how to drive. And look at the video on how to learn to drive a car. There's a two by four exercise in there and there's exercises that you can do uh, in a parking lot and all of that will translate into your overall driving and make you a better driver overall. Okay, so definitely have a look at that. <laughs> I 
<laughs> Sebastian, no, that's that's not. I, I wouldn't go there, okay? Because <laughs> you could get into some trouble. Joshua, what was your last question? I missed it. You have to understand, Joshua, that there's a lot of comments going past here, and it's hard for me to keep up uh, because there's so many in one spot here. So I'm just trying to read them. Okay, so. Uh, was it the streaming service that I'm utilizing? Uh, is that the question you asked, Joshua? Just say yes there. You are most welcome, Muhammad. Yes, and that is correct what Joshua just said. Uh, is that the question you asked me, Joshua, uh, about the streaming services that I'm using? Okay. David, that's great. Yes, I have heard it. It's really good, sir. Thank you. And yes, to the small amounts of drugs, only over-the-counter and prescription medication are you allowed to carry. So know that. Oh, okay. Yes, Joshua. Uh, I am using OBS to stream my live stream. I also have fiber optics. So I'm running about 270 megs per second of internet speed on my computer plus I have a new computer I have a, a new um, iMac so all of that makes my streaming work fairly well it's it took me quite a number as as some of the smart drivers who have been here for a while will tell you my some of my first streams were not that good the, the quality was not that good and as well I have a C922 Logitech uh, webcam which works really well and if you're gonna get the uh, C922 Logitech webcam, you gotta download the gaming software for it and change some of the settings on the camera to make your stream work really well, okay? Uh, okay, Sebastian, not really sure what the maximum is for speeding. It depends what country you're in. I know that there are countries in the world that you can be ticketed on a percentage of how much you make for a year. So there are some people who have been ticketed for a speeding ticket of like $900,000 or some crazy amount like that. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Um, blue zone. What is a blue zone in California? Don't know that one. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay, uh, one more thing. I'm just gonna quickly go over a course I have for sale over at the Smart Drive Test channel here. Just take up your time here for a couple of minutes. Oh, lost it. All right, so pass your road test first time. Transition, there we go, is available over at the Smart Drive Test channel. For those of you watching on the replay, the course is over there. Guaranteed to pass your road test first time. These are the components of the course. There's a glossary which will give you uh, all of the terminology of driving, painted islands, right of way, all of those types of things is in the glossary. Lesson one is about primary controls and how to learn to work the primary and secondary controls in the vehicle. All of these lessons have review quizzes. It's uh, three review questions that will go over the information that's presented in the lesson. Uh, maneuvers required for the road test, two-point reverse turn, K-turns, uh, three-point turn, reverse stall park, uh, parallel parking and whatnot, road test uh, rules of the road, who has the right of way, two um, controlled intersections with stop signs, uh, four-way stop signs, two-way stop signs, and then review questions, road test turning and merging. Uh, mock road test and tips in lesson five and then finally road test docs is the other the last lesson in Pash road test first time Okay, there's also a toolkit in the toolkit is a schedule for training This is a six-week schedule that will show you what you need to do each week to be successful and prepare for your road test Guide for mentors. So you're the people who are helping you to learn to drive There's a guide in there that will give them some information about helping you to learn how to drive and explaining to them that learning how to drive and preparing for a road test are two different things and that they need to give you some space to be able to learn how to prepare for your road test. There's also a license checklist. So the day you show up for your road test, there are certain things that you need to have in place and all of that is on that checklist. There's also a pre-trip inspection checklist. If you're taking your own vehicle or you're going down with a driving school, the pre-trip inspection checklist will ensure that your vehicle is 
spot on for a road test that you're going to take and you know something simple like a taillight out or something like that if you show up at road test day you won't be allowed to take your road test because you get a taillight out and the vehicle is deemed unsafe as well the winter driving checklist and the trailering checklist a couple other things that are in the toolkit on that course finally there are practice uh, quizzes and these will prepare you for your theory test if you haven't taken your theory and your learner's permit yet all of these questions are multiple choice practice driving test questions and they all have uh, feedback right in the question so you don't have to go back to the manual and look it up and the other thing that I suggest to you if you are thinking of learners for your road test is to um, find practice driving test questions on the web do the practice driving test questions and don't use them as a test of your ability but rather to locate the gaps in your knowledge so use the test for that and then when you're done and the questions you didn't get right then go back to the manual and look them up in the manual don't re read that manual cover to cover because it will cure insomnia I promise you that okay at the end of the course there's a final quiz with 25 questions and you'll get a certificate and the certificate is from smart drive test and it has my signature on it okay so this is the total cost of uh, this total value of all of the components of the course the course is 38 bucks the glossary the toolkit practice driving test questions for a total of 268 dollars uh, the course regularly sells for 38 dollars uh, look down in the description and you'll find a coupon for 30 percent off youtube 30 and type that into the coupon box over at smart drive test and you'll pick the course up for 2660 2660 is half the price it will cost you to retake your road test and as i said the course is fully guaranteed first time pass your road test first time and six weeks and you've taken the full course i'll give you your money back and as well there's bonus material in the course how to drive a manual car how to pull a trailer and winter driving which is an extra bonus of 78 dollars so the total for the course the total value of the course is 268 dollars but for today, you can get the coupon YouTube 30 and you can head over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick that course up for 2660 as well. You have complete access to me. You can email me questions and I will answer all of your questions right away and make sure that you and help you to pass your road test first time because you don't want to fail your road test because failing your road test is a real drag. So head over there, pick that course up and make sure that you pass your road test first time and are successful in passing your road test. So if you have any questions at all, by all means ask me that. And you can as well, what I suggest is if you head over to the Smart Drive Test website as well, make sure you sign up for the newsletter because in the newsletter I send out uh, pass your road test first time tips, exclusive offers for courses that we have at Smart Drive Test and as well, uh, strategies for smart drivers to remain crash free on the newsletter so all of that uh, is available over there at the smart drive test website so and again if you have any questions at all you can email me questions and I'm more than happy to help you out with all of that so okay <laughs> Gordon how come the driving exam does not require you to forward park uh, not very often it requires you to forward park the reason that it doesn't require you to forward park rather that you were uh, required to do reverse stall park is to show that you have due care and control of the vehicle and essentially that is the fundamental competency for a road test regardless of vehicle is do you have due care and control of the vehicle all right so Oh, Anita, the website is www.smartdrivetest.com. That's the website. Okay, so Corey's put up the course page there. Okay, there we go. Uh, Joshua, thanks for that. Interpol originates in France and covers most countries, but their actions, what they're able to do. Uh, their authority in that in those other countries outside of France is limited in terms of what they can do. Uh, yeah, Corey, you're right about that. You know, if you can reverse stall park and you can parallel park, then uh, yes, it's assumed that you can forward park.
Oh, you're most welcome, Joshua. Anything we can help you out. So yeah, essentially my first live streams were not very high quality. So once I upgraded my internet service, I got a new computer and I got a new webcam, all of this came into place and I was able to get it looking uh, to the level that I would like it to look. Okay, and Generation 4, thank you for that. Blue Zones are handicapped parking in California. Yeah, I just hadn't heard them called uh, Blue Zones before. Okay. There we go. Okay. Generation four, how would police ticket Bill Gates and other millionaires in states and Canada? Generation four, uh, Bill Gates, I do not believe, drives himself around very often. I think most of the time he has somebody else driving him around. <laughs> All right, so if you like the live stream, uh, give it a thumbs up. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel already, hit that subscribe button. If you're watching on the replay, leave a comment down in the comment section. All of that helps us out and gets uh, all of this information out for new drivers to uh, pass a road test, remain crash free, or to start a career as a truck or bus driver. And I think for tonight, we're going to wrap it up there. Uh, and uh, for all of those of you who have passed a road test in the last week, congratulations on passing your road test. That's really great. And for those of you who have an upcoming road test, uh, good luck on that. And by all means, leave me any questions that you have, and I'll be more than willing to ha help you out and uh, work on video topics and those types of things, anything that I can do to help you out. Generation 4, you are a smart driver. You're here on my channel. That's who I generally call the people who are here at the Smart Drive Test YouTube channel. So, Aditha, have I ever been in a crash? Yes, I was in a crash when I was 16. Uh, went off the road, lost control of the vehicle, and hit a tree. And fortunately, nobody was hurt in the crash, so yes. Joshua, thank you. And have a good night, everyone. And for those of you having a road test uh, coming up, good luck in your road test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. Bye now.